Seemingly not, yes. So um, welcome to the final session of the day. My name is Wolfgang Maurer. I uh, simultaneously work for two companies. One is a university, the Technical University of Applied Sciences in Regensburg. And the other one you may have heard of is Siemens Corporate Research, where I'm active in the um, embedded Linux team and have been there for like um, 10 years by now. So what I'm going to talk to you in this um, late session, I guess you're all very exhausted already from uh, a day full of learning and knowledge. So I'm the more happy that um, you came here to be tortured with a little statistics at the end of the day is about embedded Linux quality assurance. And I decided to give it the catchy subtitle, how to not lie with statistics. I may um, say a few words about that later on. Yeah, I already did say a little something about me, Siemens Corporate Technology and uh, the University of Regensburg. So what I'm assuming about you is that you are in some way or another in the Linux system building business, that your software architect, that your system architects. Um, safety, I'm sorry, statistical methods are increasingly applied in safety critical domains, in real time domains. I'm not assuming much um, real time knowledge besides our familiarity with some elementary data sets maybe, or um, knowledge about safety critical processes. I've spoken a lot about that um, the last time I was here at ELC. And most importantly, I'm also not assuming much statistical knowledge. Um, that's deliberate. If uh, any statisticians should be in the audience, I'm pretty sure you will have lots of reasons to complain. <laughs> because this is, of course, not, this is of course not, not a statistics lecture. It's not in, uh, supposed to be a statistics lecture. So the st statisticians, oh my god, that's such a complicated word, take what I say with a grain of salt, and the rest um, take it as simplified recipes. So I was uh, already mentioning how to not lie with statistics. This whole lying with statistics phrase, um, or uh, don't trust the statistics that you haven't um, made up yourself, um, belongs to the most stupid sayings um, in science, because statistics is actually what drives um, our world in an increasing fashion when you think of machine learning, when you think of all the mathematical optimization techniques that we apply, when you think of all these stochastics algorithms that we apply, but still I wanted to get people into my session, so I chose this catchy one. How I should have actually called it is not how to not lie with statistics, especially because I don't want, I don't want to insult anyone who has used statistical methods in a way um, that I'm not recommending in this session is more to the point, how to avoid incidentally over-interpreting measured data, presenting data in not so useful ways and or drawing unsupported conclusions from statistical analysis, which is scientifically precise, but I guess would have made the program committee a bit angry because they would have needed an extra wide website just to accommodate the title. Okay, so, but let me, let me get right into the talk. Um, where do we need statistical methods in embedded quality, embedded Linux quality assurance? And that's uh, these days actually quite um, a lot of topics where statistical methods come into play. We want to determine, we want to ascertain um, some, some um, several functional properties of our systems like um, speed and throughput. Of course, we want to measure how fast our systems compute, we want to measure how much data we can process per time unit. Um, in real-time systems, we are concerned with uh, response latencies and things like that. But we also need to deal with um, things like build consistency. If you think of long-term supported systems, then we should make sure that a system that's being built now can be reproduced in exactly the same way in 10 years' time, which requires some statistical methods we're, of course, also interested in non-functional properties like stability, availability, scalability, correctness, you name it, all these illities that, are typically, that typically cannot be measured directly, but that can just be determined via some indirect measurement, via um, determining other properties, and then statistically inferring how far we've come in these qualities or illities. Um, testing is, of course, one field where statistics plays an increasing role. We collect lots of data with uh, continuous integration um, tests with load testing, and we use statistics to, for instance, um, check if our process efficiency is good. So if we are not checking in too many bugs, if we are actually 
are trying to reduce the amount of bugs compared to the amount of new bugs that we bring into our system. That's a statistical problem. Um, it can be also used to detect gradual changes in process or detect um, if changes to the process actually have had good or bad outcomes. Same thing goes for reviewing patches. Um, we use statistics to test how efficient these reviews um, we can use. We don't necessarily use statistics. We should use statistics more often. We could use statistics to determine if the review is actually sufficient. So if it prevents bugs from going into the system, if um, the relevant areas are covered and so on. Certification of systems is another area where statistics is becoming increasingly more and more important. So in the uh, good old olden days that maybe precede my, um, that may become before my career, my own career in computing, people used to build systems that were completely deterministic. You wrote code, you proved that the code um, was complete, that the code was working as expected, and then that was more or less um, disregarding some formal deta details of certification. These days, if you think of Linux systems that contains millions and millions and millions of lines of code, we of course cannot go with these approaches anymore, but need to statistically ascertain that we satisfy the uh, properties that are required for safety and other um, certification criteria. And even if we could still apply the aforementioned formal methods, um, formal methods to ensuring system quality. So there, are, there are people who still do that, um, who use formal verification methods to, for instance, um, do schedulability analysis on real-time systems and so on. But these people these days also implicitly rely on statistical techniques because, for instance, most um, techniques um, that do schedulability analysis require worst case execution time, either calculations or measurements. Calculations are, considering modern processes complexity, not really feasible these days. So effectively, in the end of the day, when you're doing any schedulability analysis, any proofs on real-time systems, you're also re um, relying on statistical results that gave you estimates for um, parameters like worst case execution times. Good, so enough reason to think about statistics in embedded Linux development. Why is deploying statistical techniques hard in our domain? And that, that's uh, for, the, for the obvious reasons. So uh, we are dealing with very rapidly changing systems. So statements that we make need to be computed over and over again to be um, to be accurate, we're dealing with large volumes of code that doesn't necessarily make it easier to analyze systems. We have non-overlapping communities that, that um, talk about things in very different ways, and that makes an analysis of the processes and um, of related things quite different because data that you get from one community may mean something very different than data that you get from another community and so on. Good, but uh, moving on to the main point beyond the motivation is um, dealing with data. How do we deal with data that um, can be statistically analyzed that comes up in our daily work? And actually I have to admit that when I was planning this talk, I was planning for a much wider scope that I would, um, that I would cover. Then I did prepare all the slides uh, about everything that I wanted to say, then I, um, gave this talk to me one time and after like one and a half hours I stopped talking to myself because I wasn't even halfway through. So I had to reduce quite a lot of what I was um, initially planning. So maybe some things may seem quite obvious to the um, statisticians and to those who have already done statistics, but on the other hand, the examples of um, doing things incorrectly I've chosen are all examples that I've met in my um, industrial job, so there seems to be some need to go for the, um, for the simple stuff. So before we can do statistics, we of course need to measure data in some way or another, and that is already one of the very, very elementary problems, a problem that seems very simple. You record some data that you get from the system, then you store this data, and later on you process the data. Um, but actually there's three things you need to consider that often go completely unnoticed. The first thing 
is about reproducibility. Of course, when someone is doing a measurement, he or she knows exactly what uh, he or she measured, but that may change completely in a week, that may change completely in a month. And it very, very often, it's very often the case that, of course, that you get data from someone who doesn't really know how, who doesn't really remember anymore how he acquired the data in the first place. And that's then obviously a bad start to learning insights from these data. So reproducibility, can others reproduce and or interpret the results you've been measuring? That's one of the very fundamental things we need to take care of when doing statistics. And I'll show some very simple yet effective recipes on how to achieve that in the next slide. A second question that's relevant for statistical data is duration. When is certainty about what I want to infer from the data? When can certainty about what I want to infer from the data be achieved? That's particularly important when you test, um, like, for example, for real-time properties. So how long, for how long do you need um, to inspect a system before you can draw conclusions that it will really never produce, or with high certainty, never produce any bad results in production runs? Is that five minutes? Is that 10 minutes? Is that more like 10 days? and so on, and we need to ensure traceability that we do not only know, uh, that we do not only tell to others how to interpret the results, but that we also tell to others what exactly we measured in a system, so where we put, say, trace points into the kernel that are often non-standard ones, where we hooked into the system, what uh, resolutions, timer resolutions, for instance, we used when we recorded our data, and so on. And actually, the answer to at least two of the questions, traceability and reproducibility, is extremely simple. Um, when, we, when we record, so the, the, uh, a very good way to achieve these two properties is to record data in a way that's called tidy data. So tidy data was, um, is actually, when I, when I talk about these three things that you need to make, these three properties that you need to make sure that your data are tidy, they look so obvious. Um, people usually say, yeah, well, how should I do it any differently? However, on the other side, when you tell someone to record data, when you tell students to record data, when you tell engineers to record data, it never comes out in this tidy form. So that's, uh, these three rules are really one of the very gems of statistics, and it has been, um, it has taken an astonishing long while until these three rules were really formally adapted by the physics community. So for instance, in the um, R, GNU R world, that's a statistical language that I'm going to introduce later on the first papers that introduced this tidy data form really only appeared like 15 years ago. Although, of course, you may have seen this form before, uh, either in your work or in lectures. That's, of course, one of CODs, normal forms for databases, the third normal form. So in this world, it's been known for a while. In statistics, um, in statistical software engineering, it has not really completely caught up yet. So how do you produce reproducible data, data in a tidy form? Three simple rules. Whatever you measure, Whatever variables you measure, of course, you put your measurement results into some uh, matrix. Each variable forms a column, one single column. Rule number two, each observation for a column, sorry, column that way. One column, each observation forms one row. And each type of observational unit forms a table. That's more database lingo, lingo so we should more say forms um, is in one file. So I said it's not so obvious that um, data should be measured in that form. What you usually find is data in the messy form. By definition, everything that's not in tidy form is in messy form. And the messy form could be something like this. You're doing latency measurements on different systems, on ARM systems, on x86 systems. And you're measuring um, the latencies under different scenarios, under a low load scenario, under a high load scenario, given some network load and so on. And then a typical way how engineers um, do organize the data is that way. So we have all the measurement results here. And uh, we consecutively write down uh, numbers for the measurements. So that's um, 
not in the tidy form I outlined before. It's quite simple to bring it into tidy form. When you do that, you have a table that gets uh, less wide, but much, much taller. So um, yeah, as I said, one, uh, one um, variable that's measured forms one column, and each observation that is taken forms a row. So you see here the main observation that we take is about the value of the latency that we record, and there's only one single value in every row as compared to the messy format where we had multiple values in a single row, multiple observations in a row. That may seem like a total detail change when you see that for the first time, but uh, the uh, secret intention of this, of this talk, of, uh, of course, is to convince you that uh, languages like GNU R are very good to visualize and to analyze statistical data, and we'll see some examples later on how just bringing data into this form, into this tidy form, essentially reduces plotting operations to one-liners. Um, those of you who have worked uh, with uh, data in other form, who have used extensive set scripts, org scripts, um, GNU plot scripts, whatnot, uh, and know how much effort it often takes to massage data into a form that's presentable, will realize that the others will just see that uh, if you have data in that form, you only need one-liners if you have a proper statistical environment. And of course, a proper statistical environment is the R language or the R ecosystem, in my opinion. It's an open source. It's one of the oldest open source codes, basically. It's astonishingly little used in the Linux community, but it's the default, a de facto standard, so to speak, in the uh, statistics world. Um, and all the examples that I will be showing are based on the R language, so I promised uh, a hands-on approach. I'm not sure yet if I will really be so mad as to do a live example if time will permit that because live examples go wrong as all statisticians know with 99.9% .9 probability. So we'll see if there's some time left. But um, I have all the R commands that you need to reproduce the plots I'm showing. And the plotting mechanism that I'm using is also based on something that's very common in the statistical world. But that's, uh, again, astonishingly little used in the embedded Linux community, and that's the grammar of graphics. That's a language to describe not how to plot stuff like you do in uh, GNU plot or in uh, other such programs where you say, I want this color for that, I want this chart type for that, but where you really say how the data should be plotted and then the language takes care of the rest, which also accounts for why um, the plotting examples I'll be showing will be so short and to the point. Good, so regardless of the technical details, how we do the statistical analysis, there's basically three ways how to understand data. It's first a, um, a descriptive analysis that's working with numerical summaries, um, showing things like mean values or standard deviations and so on that you're all familiar um, from school. The second level is exploratory or explorative exploratory analysis, where you use, um, where you use visualization techniques to get a better understanding about the data than is possible with simple numerical summaries. And the third stage is confirmatory analysis, where you really use statistical testing, formal statistical testing, um, to ascertain specific properties of your data. I'm going to focus on point number two. Of course, if you come from the old world, from a world where, um, where formal proofs are required, where you do things like schedulability analysis and so on, then you want this confirmatory analysis as final step. But as I will be arguing, in most cases, it, it, in most cases, it really doesn't add much value to what you see from the explorat exploratory analysis. But the exploratory analysis gives you quite a head start compared to simple descriptive analysis that we often see. Good. Um, yeah, since time is flying, I'm going to go over this slide very quickly. Uh, when, when we talk about data, um, it's also, it's, um, I guess, clear that there's, there's different type of data just to make, uh, to make sure we're speaking about the same things. Basically, we can distinguish between two types of data, categorical data and 
quantitative data, you all know um, intuitively what this means. Categorical data is something like binary values, say dead or alive, or system is up, system is down, system is broken, system is operational. We can um, drive that a little further, for instance, by extending it to colors, like you have a color red, blue, green, and so on. These are, of course, different colors, but it doesn't make sense to assign either numerical values to this color. You cannot say blue must be one and red must be three. Likewise, you cannot say uh, blue is bigger than red or red is better than green. That doesn't make sense. But there's a third um, category of uh, a third type of categorical values, namely ordinal values, that uh, cannot really be associated with numbers, like in military ranks, you cannot say a, or maybe I'm pretty sure armies can, can do that. Uh, you cannot say a general is a 27 and a private is a three. Doesn't really make sense, yet still you can order these. You can say a general is higher up in the hierarchy than a private, and a private is maybe higher up in the hierarchy than uh, I don't know what, I'm pretty sure there's a lower rank. <laughs> Good, which, um, these, these um, type, of, um, type of numbers, these types of numbers have appeared in the, in the table before. So here, for instance, system, of course, is, type of system is, is a categorical value that we cannot order. We cannot say a Tegra is best, better than a Raspberry Pi. Perhaps we can in some sense or another, but not in a statistical sense. And we have also, Numbers that are comparable, like latencies, the value that we're actually measuring, that's a quantitative number. And um, formally, we, uh, we differentiate between, of course, discrete values and continuous values, but that's not so important um, for the rest of the talk. Good, the uh, data set that I'm considering that I'm going to play around a little bit with is what you typically get. It's a very simple data set, and it's what you typically get from um, latency analysis, like when you're, doing, when you're running a cyclic test on a preempt RT system. So I've done that on a system with multiple CPUs. I guess it had, it had four CPUs that are numbering from zero to four. I'm recording uh, an identifier with every measure that I'm taking, and I'm, of course, recording the measured value, which is a latency that I'm observing in a real-time system. So very simple data set. Yet you will see that um, this data set already contains quite a lot of information that we can get out with some proper um, exploratory visual analysis. The typical way how to plot such distributions is, of course, um, a histogram. And that is, I may have mentioned that R and um, the grammar of graphics is a very efficient plot mechanism that you, uh, you can plot with one very simple line in R. So you specify that you want to do a grammar of graphics plot. You're using data uh, from a, spe a specific variable, and you say that the interesting, the, the interesting um, that the measure that you want to look at is contained in latency. That's, um, that's a column in the data. We want, that doesn't say anything that, about how we want the data to be plotted. That just says what um, subset or what aspect of the data we'd like to plot. You specify how it looks with so-called geoms, and here I specify that I want a histogram, and yeah, well, miracles of modern technology, I do indeed get a histogram that you've all seen before. Now, that uh, seems, already seems to be a point where like 50% of um, programmers are happy with, but of course, coming back to the statisticians, statisticians know that this is not a, um, that this method requires some parameter to be chosen, namely how wide the, um, the individual bars should be. Uh, in that example, the system cannot know what we want to convey, what the uh, measurement resolution is. For instance, it has chosen a, a fairly, fairly large histogram size. So there, that's, one, that's one of the uh, occasions when you need to manually tell the computer system um, something about the data that it can better visualize it and here I've given an explicit parameter to the plotting system that specifies the bin width. I've measured with a resolution of one microsecond and you see if I make the bins only one microsecond wide then I already get more details into my graph. 
Of course, I've not measured on a single core system. That's boring. Single core systems are not available anymore. These days I've measured on a multi-core system with four CPUs, and I would in some way or another like to see how the different CPUs in the systems compare to each other. That's very simple in um, the grammar of graphics. So I tell I want to see another aspect of the data. That aspect is another column in the tidy data, if you recall that. So that's this column. And of course, we've already spent our two-dimensional diagram on showing the histogram. So we need to add another dimension to the graph, which can, for instance, be color that I've specified here. I've said, um, do not just take the latency aspect from the data. Also, do consider the CPU measurements and adapt the fill of the, um, of the histogram to the CPU. So I choose these four ugly colors um, that then um, give some extra information about how the CPUs did. That's still not the, the uh, very good ordering. So we see we can we can see the shape of the distribution for CPU zero, the red CPU, but the other CPUs are just stacked on top of this measurement for CPU zero, which gives us reproduces the system global, um, so to speak, latency measurement. So you see this is just a colored version of this. But what we actually like to have is um, a visualization by each CPU, and that we can do in some ways in the grammar of graphics. I could, for instance, specify that I do not want to stack the measured results. I want to dodge them next to each other, so we get something like this. And then you see, you, um, you see, you better see the individual recordings for the CPUs. A slightly preferable way, in my opinion, to deal with um, this second, uh, the second aspect to the data is to facet the data into different subplots. Anyone who has done that with a mechanism like Gnuplot knows that this can be uh, very painful depending on how you plot with the grammar of graphics. It's really easy. I tell, I want, I tell the system I want to facet my data by the CPU, by the measured variable CPU. And then I get uh, the same plot that I specified here in the geom repeated for each value, for each uh, distinct value of CPU that's present in the data. And so we get four nice uh, plots that immediately give more clarity to what we've measured. Good. Those of you who do real-time work may have realized in this graph that this is uh, kind of strange that we don't have any values here, so that we have a very sharp initial peak and that we also don't have substantial values here. And that's um, a problem that often, that often occurs in box plots that you see from, from analysis. That's because people tend to measure for a very long time. So I didn't, I didn't even measure um, too long here. It's just like 60,000. Um, data points in one bin, that's not too much, but that's already way too much um, for, the, for the visual presentation to make some details visible, uh, invisible, sorry, that are in the data. And that can be fixed, as you all know, by adapting or by, by transforming this axis here. One typical transformation is a log transformation that you're all familiar with uh, from school, I guess. That's not the most clever transformation for data that contains zeros, because you know that um, taking the logarithm of zero is somewhat challenging. So a, a transformation that, um, that is recommendable, or that works well in this case, is a square root transformation. It has no problems with uh, zero occurrences, but still um, gives some more attention to the small values of the data. And that, in fact, uncovers some features that are simply not visible in the presentation before. We have very small latencies before the big spike hits. And actually, here we have quite some tail that's actually not ending at um, 75 microseconds, but I've cut it off here. That, of course, is important if you do not just care about, about the um, the maximum latency, but if you really care about temporal precision and then you need to somehow deal with these early results that don't appear very frequently, but that do appear. And that should be visible in the way you present data.
so I had to make one choice when I plotted the data, one manual choice, and that was choosing the bin width um, that the system uses to present the data. And making a manual choice is, of course, bad. So let me show you another method that um, can be used to visualize such uh, latency data that does not need um, that does not need any presentational choice at all in a so-called non-parametric method. That's the cumulative distribution function that's shown here. This graph contains the very same information as this graph in a slightly different form. So we um, write down the latencies on the x-axis and what's then uh, contained in the y-axis, a fraction from zero to one, is how many of the data points um, belong to the range up to 50 microseconds, up to 100 microseconds, up to 150 microseconds, and so on. So you see the uh, data span latencies from zero to about 200 microseconds. At 200 microseconds, we have covered 100% of all the um, observed values. Um, and at smaller latencies, we have covered smaller fractions of the data. But we didn't, need, we didn't need to choose any width of the bin or something, um, some other manual parameter. This always looks, this, so um, this, always, this always can be produced without human intervention. It, of course, requires some, um, some familiarity to be interpreted directly, but when you look at it, it's not so hard. You see here, the first increase is around yeah, 55 or so microseconds. That, of course, corresponds to this spike here. Then we have another sharp increase here. That's about here, so this is the second spike. This, um, this increase in the graph corresponds to this guy here, around 100 microseconds, and yeah, then basically it flattens out and we covered the majority of all values. Good. Um, Okay, I guess I still, I still have too many slides, even after reducing the amount of slides. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me go over that quickly. I said in the beginning that um, summary statistics, numerical summary statistics, are quite often um, a fairly inaccurate way of describing data. Yet, still, you see, um, you see, you observe quite often that um, data like uh, scheduling latencies is described by two simple numerical summaries, namely mean value and standard deviation. That, of course, comes, um, or that maybe comes from the fact that we're all taught in school that everything in statistics is a Gaussian process some way or another. And as you all know, you can describe a Gaussian distribution by exactly these two, these two summary values. Um, mean value and standard deviation, that suffices to reconstruct the whole Gaussian. Unfortunately, this whole statement about everything in nature being Gaussian is maybe true for nature in the sense of physics or for nature in the sense of biology. It's unfortunately not true for nature in the sense of computer science. Uh, so here, you very rarely uh, get to work with, uh, with Gaussian distributions. I mean, it's immediately obvious from a visual inspection of the uh, latency data. Actually, I've constructed this, this Gaussian function here. Let me switch to the, switch to the uh, square root axis scale so that we see the details. I've constructed this Gaussian distribution from these measured values. So I've taken the mean value from the measured value. I've taken the standard deviation from the measured value and then computed this Gaussian function. And as I guess is clearly obvious from these two graphs, these are two very, very different distributions. The Gaussian is much wider. It's, um, it's less tall, and this graph should make it clear to you that just using these two summary values is really not sufficient to describe data with uh, some structure. Good. Um, yeah, as an example, as an example of how to produce such statistics, I'm showing the corresponding grammar of graph command um, to produce the cumulative distribution function or the empirical cumulative distribution function because it's based on, on measured values. Again, it's a very, very short statement. So I'm telling the system I want to use some data where I'm interested in analyzing the latency. Now, if, um, I have two different um, statistical distributions, the Gaussian and the proper measured distribution that I'm 
are denominating by type. I'm using a color to distinguish between the Gaussian and the measure distribution, and I want a um, cumulative distribution function, and that simple command line gives me that graph. So here from this graph, again, it's uh, pretty obvious that uh, the distributions are not identical. Good, um, so playing around with this simple data set has already consumed quite uh, a lot of time that's allocated to this talk, but still I really wanted to go over that in um, a very great detail because um, already plotting the data is all too often done in a way that doesn't really do justice to the data, despite the fact that, as I have shown you with the R commands, you could do it with very little effort in a very, um, very precise and uh, apt manner. So what I've done basically in this last slide is already starting the next uh, topic that I would like to discuss that's about comparing data sets. So this problem, that's the second standard problem that occurs in the statistical analysis of systems. So it occurs, for instance, when you want to track behavioral changes of the system after you're doing an update, say you're updating from kernel 4 point something to 4 point something plus X and want to observe are there any performance regressions, then you take a measurement set from the old kernel, a measurement set from the new kernel, and somehow need to decide by these measurements and by going beyond the, um, the uh, mean value and the standard deviation if the system's gotten any better, if the system's gotten any worse, if the system hasn't changed, so you need to prove that, of course. To your customer, you, want to, you may want to use that to evaluate alternative choices that you have when you use libraries and so on, which one performs better. And there's also lots of, lots of other use cases to do that. Um, as we've seen, there's one way, one way to do that is by visual inspection or by explorative analysis. That's, if you do that properly, very apt for the purpose. Comparing summaries, as I have outlined now for the uh, 27th time, I guess, is not really a sufficient way to do that. So just comparing mean value and standard deviation. Don't do that, don't, don't do that. Um, visual exploration is as simple as computing summaries, but much more effective. And there's also some formal methods and tests that you can employ that can make sense. Uh, that's why it's partly yes, but usually in most cases it doesn't give you any extra information that you get from the visual inspection uh, besides the joy that you can say, oh, I've used some formal method like a t-test or Wilcoxon rank some test or anything else that sounds fancy and that may impress your customers. Um, Yeah, so I guess I've with the so with the with the, uh, with the with this graph type with the with the cumulative distribution function, I've already given you the appropriate command line uh, that you may want to use to compare such distributions. So I'm not going to get into any further details with the three. Um, examples that I would have prepared for this purpose, which also means I'm going to skip the live demo because I need uh, the minutes that I have left for, um, for some other stuff, which uh, at least make sure that the live demo doesn't fail. You just don't do it, then it doesn't fail. Um, let, me end, uh, let me end this um, part of my considerations with what can go wrong when you're doing this, this elementary uh, analysis of statistical data like scheduling data, like performance data, and so on. And again, all the points I'm making here do really sound extremely obvious, but if you look at how it's done in the real world, then these extremely simple points um, or these, these extremely easy to make mistakes are being made very often. So um, the, from the... Um, from the list, I'm going to pick three. Of course, use inappropriate summary statistics. I may have already mentioned that. Use wrong inadequate bin sizes. That's the second most often occurring thing that you see. So if you're using a, parametr a, a parametric method, make sure that you choose your parameter parameters correctly or use a non-parametric method like the um, CDF. And what also happens quite often is um, 
that people don't specify the sample sizes. And basically, without sample sizes, it's impossible. I didn't, I didn't go into the, um, the formal examples that would make use of this information. But if you don't specify your sample size, then basically you don't know if, um, if specific um, statistical tests will work. I've said that data in computer science are usually not Gaussian distributed. Many statistical tests rely on the fact that the data are Gaussian distributed, except if you have a whole lot of data statisticians, please close your eyes. But if you just have, um, if you have millions and millions of data points, then it doesn't really matter if the data are Gaussian distributed or not. Most statistical tests will work fairly well regardless of the um, non-normality of the data. But for that to know, you of course need to know the sample size. And if you want to, if you need to know the sample size, it needs to be reported. Good. Um, coming, coming to the final part of the talk with only 15 or so slides left for the next uh, 10 minutes is um, one thing that people are trying more and more often these days, and that's to make not just to describe data and to learn about the system behavior from data, but to make predictions from measured data, how a system will behave in the future, how a system will behave in corner cases that have not been explored yet, or um, um, using predictions to, um, to satisfy some certification authorities that the system they have built is really satisfying the criteria that they demand. So making uh, predictions from statistics is essentially a very simple process. It's two easy steps. You find a mathematical model that describes the data. And then you just extend the model outside the current measured range. And that's all you need. There you go. You can predict the future, of course. Um, there are some, some detailed problems, like is there such a mathematical model that describes the system? If I have found a model, does it really, in fact, describe my system? Or does it just describe what I want, um, what I would like the system to be, and so on? And when you look at how um, stat um, modeling techniques and prediction techniques are currently used in our field, then you really need to be aware of the first rule of predictions when you look at uh, statements that are made um, in that respect. If things sound too good to be true, they probably are not true. So there's lots, lots, of, um, lots of ideas these days that claim that you can measure this and that aspect of a development process and then prove that the system is completely apt for, um, for safety critical deployments and so on and that you can measure for five minutes and then you know that the system will satisfy all latency requirements during the next 10 years or so. Sounds very good, but um, is likely not true. Um, how, do you, how do you go about when you model, when you find a mathematical model for your data? That's, of course, a problem that uh, has been considered for um, a couple of decades. And I suppose that many of you will have heard about linear regression. Right, so most of you have. Okay, great. So I can be quick about that. I'm not showing any real data set here. I'm just I'm showing some made-up data set that uh, connects kilo hills, whatever that is, to the number of unicorns. And we want to find a functional relationship between um, the amount of kilo hills I have with the amount of unicorns I get. Again, from a visual inspection of the data, I've done a, a scatter plot of the available measured data. It seems quite clear that there is such a relationship. Um, the more hills, the more unicorns, as things are in life. Question is just how can we mathematically ascertain this relationship and how can we find the best possible slope um, for, the, uh, for the linear relationship? How you do that is, of course, you formulate a, a model, a guess. So I said I'm guessing that there's a linear relationship. The number of unicorns, y, is related in this fashion, in a linear fashion, to the number of kilo hills. So we have some, uh, some intercept term that shifts this line up and down, and we have a uh, slope how steep the line is. The statistical task at hand now is, of course, to estimate the coefficients beta 0, beta 1, slope and intercept, and finding out how my errors are distributed. Uh, the beauty about that, it's a very simple model that um, describes quite, quite a lot of processes that we are seeing very accurately. The bad thing about that is you can apply linear regression to 
everything and you will always get the result and it'll always look um, halfway decent, but in most cases it will describe the data very inaccurately and especially you won't be able to draw any, uh, to draw any, um, to make any predictions from such misspecified models. So, uh, I just realized I haven't shown I haven't shown the GNU R commands that are necessary to produce such a model. It's another one-liner. I will correct this deficiency in the published version of the slides. Um, for now, let me just show you the results, the data set, and the line um, that describes the functional relationship. And again, without going into any details, let me give the warning that, um, or let me let me say that there are very specific mathematical tests after you've, you've done the model that you need to apply to ascertain that the model actually does, does fit your data. Nobody ever does that, of course. But it's, uh, it's actually a very, very simple thing to do. You need to test for basically three, uh, for basically four, you need to test four assumptions that you are implicitly making when you come up with such models. And that is first that your errors are normally distributed. So here we come back to the standard Gaussian process. We have this line. Of course, the measured points are not all exactly on this line, but they um, scatter around it. And the way they scatter around it needs to be in a Gaussian fashion. You can um, ascertain that with uh, this kind of plot. Uh, the errors need to be uncorrelated. That's a more mathematical thing, but that can also be quantitatively ascertained. The, Variance of errors needs to be constant, and for the fourth thing, the design matrix has to have full rank. I really haven't found any um, image that could explain what this means, so I'm just stating it without qualifying it further, but um, rest assured that you would need to test that if you want to make sure your model's correct. So from this model, from this model, all these um, conditions are actually fulfilled, and um, unicorns can be quite well predict be predicted by kiloidrosils. When we look at when we look at data that actually occur in computer science and that people are using um, that people are using to make predictions, then we see that life with uh, this kind of data is not so simple. So, as um, a final example of how you should not do things, let me show you this data set that um, uses bug fix commits. So that has really been used in some uh, safety certification efforts to prove to authorities that a development process of certain pieces of software are good enough to trust um, your life to it. What, uh, what people have measured here is that they've taken the number of bug fix commits, because bug fix commits, as we all know, fix bugs, so they don't introduce any problems, any more problems, never have. And uh, they've recorded the time that at the time um, at what point these bug fix commits were introduced into the system. Now, what you can see from the data, of course, is that the number of bug fix commits went down over time, which is a um, yeah, natural thing, because either bugs are fixed or people start losing interest in fixing bugs because there's too many of them. Now, the natural thing to do, of course, with um, this kind of data is to find a model that describes the relationship between the time when bug fix commits are issued and uh, the amount of bug fix, of the, sorry, the time after a piece of software has been released and the amount of bug fix commits that go into the software. You do that not with linear regression, but with um, a more generalized form of it. I'm not going to get into details about that, but what uh, you end up with in the, at the end of the day is a graph like this. So you have a functional relationship between time and bug fix commits. And again, that looks as nice as the graph, uh, as the relationship between Udrasils and unicorns. And so, yeah, the natural thing to do is say, yeah, let's make predictions with that, because if we know how uh, bug fixes happened in the first 60 whatever time units of the product, we can just extend that, predict the future from that, which is easy to do with statistical software, and then you can say, okay, at this point we will have essentially reached uh, a situation where we don't get any more bug fix commits into the system, and 
that means the system is error free and so uh, it can, we can use it in, um, in, safety, in safety critical environments. Now who of you is going to buy this kind of argumentation from me? No one, I'm, I'm really glad you don't. The problem is that um, certification authorities tend to buy this kind of argumentation these days. Of course, um, the problem with, uh, with this approach is clear. People did the regression, did the regression, computed a model, um, predicted the future from the model, but the only detailed problem that they overlooked is that this model doesn't, certif doesn't satisfy any of the requirements that I've mentioned before, any of these four conditions that need to be fulfilled for a model to be um, yeah, correct or um, at least appropriately describe the data. Good, uh, with that, so I'm, I'm, listing, I'm listing the issues here that this model had. It's like uh, errors residuals are all completely wrong, so we don't have a normal distribution of the errors. That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be so bad, but the accuracy of the base data is, um, is also not a given thing. The functional relationship between time and amount of bug fix commits is if you look um, at the statistical model in detail and if you do actually look at the diagnosis that you get from the statistical software such that the software says, okay, so the, uh, the, um, the variables that you're using, that you're trying to use to predict the amount of bug fix commits are not sufficient to give an, uh, to give an uh, accurate model. But of course, if you don't look at the diagnostics, this problem won't bother you. So that's, uh, that's the three things that are wrong with this model. Um, if people would have done the process that I have outlined uh, very briefly in this talk, is that we find an appropriate technique, fit and plot the model, and most importantly, check diagnostic data, then they would have realized that this model is not really appropriate for the task um, they, are about, they are about to, um, to take on. But uh, maybe let that be, if that's the um, major thing you take home from you from this talk, namely, if you apply statistics, then please make sure that um, you've done your homework, that you've um, not just computed models, but you, that you've checked that your model is really accurate, then I'm already quite happy because that means chances, statistical chances are, have improved that I'm not going to die because of uh, mispredictions from software quality data. Good, um, thank you very much for your interest in this uh, final session. I know that I've had way too many slides despite uh, still not even coming to the, uh, to the fine points and to the deeper points of statistics. Uh, yeah, but still, again, thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for suffering with the simple examples and the many slides. <laughs>